Michael Pelego is the Director of Operations and Study Research Coordinator for the nonprofit Sorensen Molecular Geological Foundation located in Salt Lake City, Utah, and a PhD student in human genetics at the University of Pavia, Italy. He has, in his eight years with the foundation, Ugo has supervised the worldwide collection of nearly 100,000 DNA samples and corresponding genealogical records and given nearly 150 lectures on DNA, genealogy, and LDS church history topics. Ugo has also authored and co-authored a number of publications related to DNA and ancestry, including Resolving the Paternities of Oliver N. Buell and Mosiah L. Hancock through DNA. The, how do you pronounce this, actually? The phylo, what's the, phylogeny? Yeah. The phylogeny of the four Pan-American mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, implications for evolution and disease studies, and a number of other things you can read in, in the program, and that way I don't have to pronounce them. So uh, with that, please welcome Ugo. Okay, I have to make Im an immediate disclaimer. This is not another presentation on DNA and Book of Mormon, so you don't have to leave the room. Um, also, I noticed there are a lot of people in the audience that speak uh, Italian, so if you don't like the accent, we can do it in Italian. How many of you speak Italian? And yeah, look how many hands. Good. So we should do it. We can do it with an accent, or we can do it in Italian. I am very pleased to be here today. Um, I like uh, the, the purpose of my presentation is basically to summarize uh, the last 10 years of. Uh, kind of looking into the prophet genes. And some of the material, about 50% of this presentation has been presented elsewhere before or published. And uh, but I've been asked to kind of, you know, re represent it and polish it a little bit, update it. And so uh, bear with me if you already heard some of this information before. And um, the rest of the presentation will present some novel information regarding you know, some of the uh, things that uh, I feel uh, uh, I learned from the prophet genes, and uh, that might shed some light about, um, particularly about his ancestry and uh, and um, where he came from. So basically, uh, what uh, what I like for, to impress in your mind, and as a question uh, that was asked of me before I, I even came up here and spoke uh, to speak to you, was um, how accurate can DNA be used for ancestry? And uh, what, uh, what I like for, to impress on your mind is that DNA is not uh, an instrument to replace uh, or substitute information that could be obtained elsewhere, but it does add a level of understanding, it does add a level of truth, and increase the level of confidence based on uh, a context that you might have. So basically, you might have a genealogical or historical question uh, an hypothesis or some rumors that you like to test, and DNA might come handy in that situation. Rarely you just take DNA alone, and that provides the answer you want to. So this is kind of like uh, the approach I took with regards of studying the Prophet Joseph Smith's life. Uh, everything kind of started back in 1999, 2000, when I first uh, began uh, working with uh, Professor Scott Woodward at, uh, as a student uh, at BYU, and uh, continue to this day my association with him, and um, we, we learned at that time, well, th there were a couple of things that kind of led us to, to Joseph Smith. Number one, we were about to begin a large study that, uh, where we wanted to build a database, basically, that uh, contained both genealogical and genetic data. We want to be able to use DNA to assist people with their genealogical research, and in order to do that, we have to uh, kind of calibrate the system, and uh, what a better place than Utah to do so, where you have extended families uh, with uh, good genealogies uh, and uh, you know multiple individuals that you could uh, ask for a DNA sample and kind of use as guinea pigs to calibrate the whole system. And uh, the Smith family was definitely one of them. Hiram Smith alone has about 15,000 living descendants here in Utah, so that's a uh, you know, try to go to a couple of those reunions and get people to give me a DNA sample. And as I did so, I, did so, I learned a, an interesting thing that, that was earlier on, that Joseph Smith, who 
taught us how important it is to do family history and genealogy, uh, he had a, a brick wall, maybe probably more than once, but at least he had a, brick, uh, a genealogical brick wall right in his genealogy in which uh, the ancestry, the paternal line of his family, the Smith line, um, cannot really be traced with certainty. And uh, there is an article that was written um, in 1991 by Elaine Nichols, who was, uh, who was the Smith specialist, the Smith genealogist. And it uh, seems like at that time there was no one that knew as much as the Smith genealogist as she did. And basically, um, in, in, uh, in her conclusion was that uh, the genealogical data that we have about a possible English origin of Robert Smith, who is the ancestor of Joseph Smith Sr. and Joseph Smith Jr., is very sketchy and uh, cannot be used for confidence. So basically, we are only confident all the way to a Robert Smith, possibly born in 1626, um, who shows up in New England, in, Massa in Boston, Massachusetts, in 1638 as an indentured servant to another man. So think about this detail, because we'll, we'll uh, bring it up again later on, you know, but the fact that we have a 12 years old boy without siblings, without parents, working for somebody else as an indentured serv servant in Boston, Okay, kind of an unusual situation, if you will, maybe, maybe common at that time, but um, definitely something worth looking at closer. Now, at that time we thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if we can reconstruct the Joseph Smith genetic signature, the paternal line signature that we have here, and then, uh, somehow, as we do this project, this large project that we want to do, collect DNA samples from Smith in England, particularly in the area where we think this boy came from, see if we find similar genetic signatures there, and perhaps bridge the gap between the Utah or, or Mormon uh, uh, Smith and those in England, and for, you know, find a way to bridge this genealogical gap using DNA. And I want you, you know, I'll try to stay away from uh, too much biology jargon, uh, kind of late, and you're probably tired, so, you know, genealogy, biology, two things that are going to get you to sleep right away, right? But <laughs> there are a couple of things you kind of need to understand. And so here, for this type of work, uh, we were looking at a particular marker that uh, is passed from father to son. So. Only males have this marker, and it's only narrated along the paternal line. And so, in our, in our, our idea was, uh, you know, there is a, a marker here that follows exactly the surname line. So we know something about the genealogy, here it is, and, and we can possibly reconstruct this marker using uh, living descendants of the Smith family, and then use this marker to look uh, for Joseph Smith ancestry in England. So it will be a Joseph Smith Jr. paternal lineage marker, basically. It's called the Y chromosome. We look a little bit at uh, Joseph Smith uh, uh, posterity, see if there were living, uh, what we were looking at were the red um, male descendants and broken paternal lines. So basically we're looking for two or three Smith individuals we share Joseph Smith as the most recent common ancestor. That's what MRCA stands for. And uh, if I could get the DNA of a, a male individual Smith with an unbroken line to Joseph Smith, and then from possibly a sibling, uh, not Joseph Smith, but another son, and compare the two, and the marker would be the same, then uh, I would have identified also Joseph Smith Jr. marker without having to test his blood or, or uh, his bones or his hair or anything. You know, I would have that type of information. And likely we found some individuals that, uh, that met this. This wasn't very easy because uh, Joseph, although Joseph Smith had uh, something like 11 children, only four grew, um, grew up to adulthood and had children. And basically there are like almost two and a half of these lines, they are still uh, have descendants today. So not a lot, I mean, there are about 300 descendants of him, but um, only basically you can trace them from two of these uh, um, sons, Alexander Hale Smith, who was a, uh, an apostle in the reorganized church, and Joseph Smith third of was the first president of the reorganized church. And we have these two descendants. This is their DNA. This is the, 
the marker that I was telling you about for individual one and individual two. We compared all the values, all the DNA markers that we got for, uh, for this particular profile we wanted to build, and we found they were identical, which was exactly what we were hoping for. Uh, there are instances in which, although you have genealogical data that seems to point you know, that this, the, the DNA of the two individuals should be the same, because of an undocumented adoption or an illegitimacy, you have the right genealogy but the wrong DNA. You know, it's called the, the milkman syndrome. Okay. <laughs> We talk about syndrome today, right? Early on. So, likely there there was no such syndrome here with uh, with this case, and the two individuals had uh, identical DNA markers. And because the most recent common ancestor, meaning the person that tied in uh, the soonest in their genealogy on the paternal line, is Joseph Smith Jr., then we can confidently infer that this is also Joseph Smith DNA. If I would have Joseph Smith standing by me and I'd be able to swab him and get some DNA from him, I wouldn't know any uh, additional information than what I already know based on their, of their descendants. This is how accurate this information is. Now, remember our goal was to reconstruct this information so that uh, we could go back to England and find similar fingerprint, okay, similar profile. However, um, as I was going around uh, and, uh, and meeting with different Smith family members, kind of the thing became a little bit popular and uh, we learned that this marker that we have reconstructed, this profile, could not only be used to learn something about his ancestry, but perhaps be used also to learn something about his posterity, which wasn't the, what we were uh, um, originally thinking. And um, this is one of the many statements um, that, uh, uh, that we have about uh, you know, if Joseph Smith practiced polygamy uh, to to pretty good extent in Nauvoo, where are his children from this relationship? If he was married to this other woman, we know all the children from uh, the relationship with Emma, or where are they one with the other woman? And uh, there are several statements that are floating around that have been recorded uh, even several years after uh, Joseph Smith that that he did have some children possibly and uh, we just didn't know where they were and so this is kind of like I call it a provisional list the reason I call it a provisional list is that about every other month I get a phone call or an email or somebody that they say I'm Joseph Smith descendant through so and so you know so this list keep you know the keeps adding uh, adding new name now I also refer to this list as a um, I, had, I had somebody writing me last week and say, you know, why do you think, for example, George uh, Liner was one of Joseph Smith's children? You know, I, I don't think so. I don't, you know, and uh, then all I have to say is that, you know, as long as that has been published somewhere in a book, in a journal, uh, or there is some sort of reliable record out there, that becomes a resource, that becomes a reference that can create confusion about somebody's paternity. All of these cases, I have uh, at least some sort of documented evidence, either, again, a family rumor um, that has been perpetuated or a, um, a book entry or something that said that so-and-so could be a child of Joseph Smith. In this particular presentation and, and uh, up to, the, to date, I've been able to study the five individuals you see underlined here and uh, they have been recorded as possible children of Joseph Smith and uh, learn something about their true paternity. So we start with Moron and Leo Pratt. And uh, this has been recorded in Fon Brody book, uh, No Man Knows My History. And, uh, you know, I'm not here to try to make history right. You know, somebody just write it wrong is wrong to start with. But uh, we can definitely... Uh, learn something about what really happened in the past. And Von Brody speculates that uh, Moroni Pratt is a Joseph Smith's son based on a number of her assumptions. And um, I actually, the way that this started is that I received a phone call from a Moroni Pratt descendant and uh, this individual told me, I believe I'm Joseph Smith descendant, my name is so-and-so Pratt. I uh, kind of paused a little bit on the phone. I was like, how can you believe that? You know, I mean, you're a Pratt, it's a Smith. <laughs> I guess I should tell you right there, you know. But, 
I, I wasn't familiar with the entry in, in the Von Brody book. And, uh, you know, that is kind of one of the things I learned to do because the people are coming forth and asking this question. The first things I ask them is, uh, you know, when was this uh, alleged child born? You know, like in this case, we have December 7, 1844. I don't need to talk about bees and flowers and things like that. You know, you know that this could have been, it fits with the, the, the date of Joseph Smith's martyrdom. You know, in June of 1844, they could still, you know, uh, Marianne could have been pregnant and have a child in December. It could have still been Joseph. And, um, and so this individual uh, pointed me to this reference, and so I said, okay, let's see if we can verify and test this case. We already know what Joseph Smith DNA is. Now we just need to find out what Moroni Pratt marker is, and then all we have to do is just compare the two, and we'll know. So we tested the DNA of this particular individual and asked his help to help us identify another descendant of Moroni Pratt so that we would have at least two lines that uh, would go back to Moroni Pratt as the Moroni, as the most recent common ancestor. Again, we're trying to avoid the milkman syndrome here, right? We're trying to know for if we only test one line, you know, I'm testing this person's DNA by something happened at any of this generation, you understand that although this person believed to be a descendant of Moroni, the DNA would be different. So by testing two lines, we have eliminated that possibility. And so we had now these two individuals whose DNA is identical to two living descendants. So now we know for sure without testing Moroni's broad DNA what Moroni DNA look like. Now because you're so smart attending fair conference, you, per you remember perfectly what Joseph Smith DNA looked like from the previous table, right? So you already know the answer. So is Joseph Smith uh, the father or not of Moroni Pratt? Okay, so this is the, this is the comparison. Now, you notice there are several numbers that are the same but there are quite a bit that are different. Now, geneticists have been able to um, do a number of tests, and this is all based on statistics, of course, but they tested a number of father and son uh, pairs and, uh, and see uh, the Y chromosome, this marker, is passed from father to son, is passed almost unchanged, but occasionally there are random mutations that kick in, and geneticists, based on these father and son pairs that they tested, thousands of them have been able to essentially estimate how often, on average, this mutation takes place. And they came to a conclusion that basically is about one mutation every seven generations. Okay, and we leave it to these very general uh, terms. And so if you look at the number of generations between the two profiles of Moroni Price and Joseph Smith, and you calculate that each one could have taken place every seven generations, you see how we miss the mark of Joseph Smith and Moroni time of being around. That goes, you know, almost a thousand years ago, way before. That's when the, the, maybe the two paternal lineages came together. So basically what it says to us that Joseph Smith was not the father of Moroni Pratt. That leaves the question, well, are we sure then that Parley P. Pratt is the father? So, you know, since there is this thing, we're, we're ready. We're, the reason I wanted to do this is actually in order to find the second Moroni Pratt descendant, I went through the BYU phone directory figuring that, you know, where would you find a lot of Pratt descendants, okay, BYU, right? <laughs> and start calling up and, uh, and uh, it's one of most, the most interesting things, so I call up somebody that doesn't even know you and you hear this funny accent on the other side <laughs> and you're asking for some DNA. <laughs> and, uh, but I guess I'm a good salesman because I did get what I needed. <laughs> and in this case, we have, uh, um, we have uh, uh, Pratt descending from uh, additional wife of Parley. So now, in addition to the two Moroni Pratt descendants, I have two additional lineages whose paternal uh, lineage ties back into Moroni Pratt. We compare all the, the first two of Moroni with the next two, and they're all identical showing that not only Joseph Smith wasn't the father of Moroni, but the Parley was indeed his father, has the uh, genetic marker shared within the family, ties back into Parley Piprat, which is the same of Moroni. So end of story. So if you own a copy of Fon Brody's book, hope you wrote down the pages, you can go there and mark in there, you know, that what is the correct thing. Um, at that time, we also look at two other cases. This is the one that we just, we, we just talked about. We also had a similar situation with Zebulon Jacobs. Um, 
Richard Van Wagner mentioned him as being a possible child and, uh, and in his uh, Mormon polygamy. And, uh, and also there, uh, there was this individual descendant of a Horizon Smith and, uh, who claimed that he was a, a Horizon Smith was a son of Fanny Alger. We know that Fanny Alger was pregnant when she left Kirtland, so we don't know anything about uh, they said that it could have been Joseph, but we don't really know a lot about who this child could, could have been. We don't have a record for that. But I guess this individual had this in his family as a rumor that he was a Joseph Smith descendant through Fanny Alger, and that was the child. So we have this name and tested him as well. So anyway, in any cases, you see three distinctive paternal lineages who do not share anything, well, who, do, who are not related with uh, Joseph Smith paternal lineages. So we eliminated three of these of these situa- um, cases. Um, the way the presentation is kind of built is, uh, is, is chronological in time. This is my, my work with the Joseph Smith uh, DNA. So although kind of jumping from one thing to the other, kind of like what I had time and opportunity to work on at that time. Remember, this is mostly a hobby. I don't get paid to do this. I think a lot of the speakers here <laughs> don't get paid to do what they <laughs> they're presenting. Um, so. The, the, the previous research was uh, the work that kind of was around, you know, did it with, between 2003, 2004, published in 2005. Uh, in the meantime, technology progressed. We were able to extend uh, the profile that we can get from a Y chromosome. So before we had 24 numbers, 24 um, allele values markers to, that makes that profile. Now we have up to 43 of them. So almost double the, number, the amount of information that we know for that particular lineage. Why is that, why is that important? It's because uh, the more you have, as you compare that, the more accurate you can be with things like the molecular clock, the, the, um, the number of ge- generation estimates, and with matching purposes. Although you might run into some more difficulties. In this example, the more, um, in, right here, for example, we, we observed that between two of the lineages of Alexander Hale, two individuals that we tested, there was a mutation that took place in one of the branches. Now we know that Joseph Smith still had a 12 here. This might not be very interesting to you, but it's very interesting to me, so I'm gonna share with you. But <laughs> Joseph Smith still has a 12 because, uh, again, here we have a descent of Alexander Hale, one, uh, here a descendant of Joseph Smith. So if these two have a 12 and this one is an 11, we know that the true and ancestral value was 12, and the 11 value is the mutation from the original value. I'll talk to you about random mutation. But here we have a different situation where both lines of Alexander are at 30, and the line from uh, uh, Joseph III has a 31. So now here you cannot say confidently if Joseph Smith had a 30 or a 31. And so uh, since I'm kind of meticulous and like to, to be precise with my things, you know, I wanted to find out if it was a 30 and 31 as well. And the last things I did, we, and we, uh, I will talk more about it over the end of the presentation about what is an haplogroup. Basically, the, the, all these values together make an individual Y chromosome signature, which is called haplotype. Haplotypes sharing similar characteristics are grouped together in, in a, like in a family, and that's called a haplogroup, okay? So individuals in this room that might share, they might have different Y chromosome signatures, uh, might still fit into the same haplogroup as long as they share some specific genetic characteristics, okay? Now, this might not mean a lot to you right now. It will be later on in the presentation, but this time we kind of run also um, an estimate of what could be the haplogroup based on these markers, and we got this weird code for you, it's our R1B. But how, we did, how did I go about to find what the true value was? So I went around and tested additional Smith lines. So now rather than looking at Joseph Smith Jr. as the most recent common ancestor, I look at his father. And based on DNA that I collected at this reunion, I had direct paternal um, lineages that uh, um, were shared by, uh, with Hiram and with Samuel. So now I have additional individuals I can test, compare the DNA of all these people, and now I notice that uh, the 30 is the value that goes back to Joseph Smith Sr. So 31 was the mutated value in the Joseph Smith third line. So now I know for sure that Joseph Smith also has a 30th. And so now I have a very accurate 
43 marker Y chromosome profile for the prophet. Now, this was kind of like, you know, uh, uh, what, what I was doing until uh, somebody came forth and said, hey, you remember there is also in Von Brody book, there is something about uh, Norman, Oliver Norman Buell uh, potentially being his child, and there is this extensive, uh, actually Von Brody focuses a lot on him, um, there is a statement, I don't know how accurate this is, that uh, his mother, Priscilla uh, Huntington, say that she admitted that she didn't know whether or not Norman was Joseph Smith or his father's child, you know, like her husband. And so, you know, this is maybe something that, uh, I, I don't know how accurate that quote is from uh, Priscilla, but then uh, Von Brody goes, for, goes uh, further with, this, with her comment, and she said that the physiognomy from a picture of Oliver Buell, um, seems to weigh the balance overwhelmingly on the Smith paternity. So based on the, you know, how many times we do the same thing with our genealogy. We look at a picture, we see some Native American feature in our great-great-grandmother and think, oh, maybe she was a Native American because she looks a Native American. You know, we tend to, to judge a lot uh, um, somebody's ethnicity or, or, or uh, um, how they're related based, you know, of what they look. And you can see, you know, between Joseph Smith III and Oliver Buell, if you take the beard off, probably there is quite a bit of resemblance. You know, even the hair style is the same, you know, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but, and so these are the references, in case you, you, you have that copy of the book. And uh, so, now, this was a little bit more complex. I like that because I actually had to do a different approach than what I had to do before, in which I could not find to the right descendants whose most recent common ancestor was the man that I tried to verify, which was Oliver Buell. So um, the only two people I could find goes back to a grandson of Oliver Buell, and so I cannot eliminate the possibility of the milkman syndrome between uh, these, these two generations. And so now I have uh, this profile, this genetic profile, but I'm still not confident that that is the profile that I need. So what I did is uh, we have a database, it's a, it's a public online database that correlates genealogies with uh, Y chromosome markers. And I ran these numbers that I was able to get for these two individuals to see if I would find any matches in this database. And lo and behold, a little miracle happened, really, that there was a Buell in the database. And uh, we share out of 43 markers, uh, share all but three of them with this Buell. Now, I wonder if my question was, okay, now we have the same surname, very similar, but there are three differences. So, are this, is this individual related to the other two that I already tested, or it's just a coincidence they have the same surname and a very similar um, Y chromosome? The genealogy of this individual was a little shallow. It could only go back to 1772. I could not find at this, time, at this point a connection with the Buell genealogy. So I took this information to a group. We have uh, eight professional genealogists in our organization, and I asked a couple of them, would you mind to see if you can extend this pedigree and find a connection with uh, the Oliver Buell line? And they were able to do that. So these two individuals are the one you saw before, back to O and F Buell. We know his DNA now. I want to know his DNA so that I can either confirm or exclude if Norman was his father. And uh, the genealogist extended his, his genealogy all the way to a Samuel Buell, who was brother with a John Buell, who was the, the ancestor of the individual in the database we just saw. The common ancestor now is a Samuel W. Buell, 1641, so almost... Uh, 400 years ago, which uh, would have uh, allowed for this three mutation to come in, okay, in this time, uh, the, the, the genealogical, the time and the genetic uh, clock kind of match right here. And, uh, and so because of the geneolo genealogy said that these individuals are, are related, these three here are related, and the DNA is similar, and the surname is similar, now we can see, we can say something about Oliver Buell DNA. Now, it's not that the DNA is right, and then it goes wrong, and then it goes right again. So although I don't know Oliver Buell's DNA, the fact that I know it for these three people, I also can infer confidently for him. Although I still have these three mutations, remember? So I have to exclude this three mutation right here that you saw before 
from uh, my comparison with the Joseph Smith haplotype. We also predicted the haplogroup and it became an I1B2A haplogroup. Remember that Joseph Smith was a different haplogroup, so that's already a first indication that these two belongs to two different groups. But also the haplotype, the signature, side by side, Joseph Smith and Oliver Buell, very different, completely unrelated people. And, uh, and so we can, we can confirm, based on this information and the genetics, that Oliver was indeed a, a Buell and not a Smith. So, Again, I hope you wrote those pages down and go back to your phone body copy. <laughs> Correct that piece of information right there. Now, another disclaimer I'd like to make. This is all about making story, history right to me. I, have absolutely any, I don't have absolutely any problem with the fact that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy or that uh, he was married to other women in the full meaning of being married. I know there is a lot of discussion about, you know, uh, spiritual marriages and, you know, physical marriages and so on and so forth. I don't, I don't have absolutely my testimony of Joseph Smith. My, what I feel for him has nothing to do with uh, to what extent he practiced polygamy, but it was an interesting situation in which there are literally thousands of people descending of these individuals that are wondering, based on what has been written, whether or not they are descendants of Joseph Smith. And so here you have a chance to tell these people how things are. Okay, another story with Mosiah Hancock, journal entry uh, that uh, Clarissa, uh, Clarissa Reed uh, um, went to Joseph Smith, told her that our Mosiah is dying. You know, this our Mosiah could be our meaning me and my husband, Levi, or our meaning as me and you, Joseph, you know. The, the family rumor was that this was Joseph, uh, uh, talk with other uh, historians, and, uh, including Keith Perkins, uh, that was a, a, a religious professor at BYU, and he was a descendant of Mosiah Hancock and confirmed this rumor. So there were several descendants that were convinced of that. So I said, okay, same story. Let's find some descendants. I was like, wait, you don't need to. Okay, okay. There is, we have a descendant of Mosiah Hancock, just one guy. He paid a commercial company to get his DNA done and framed. Okay, so <laughs> guess some people like to put the degrees on the wall and some people put their <laughs> DNA, you know? <laughs> so it's like, well, that saved me some time and some money. Would you send me a copy of that certificate? We start with that. Only 12 markers. Paternal line. Only 12 markers, only one descends. And say, ah, we might not have enough to know, you know. I can share 12 markers with many of you and not be related, you know, because there's just so few that we're comparing. It's called identical by state versus identical by descent. You know, coincidentally, we just match a few markers. So I say, okay, let's run these markers through the database. I know I have several Hancock in my, in my database because I was actually looking for John Hancock paternity, who Fawn Brody talks about as potential child of Joseph Smith. So there are actually two brothers, John and Mosiah, that are eligible candidates. And unfortunately, I don't have any answer for John yet. Uh, still looking for descendants of him, so if you know of any di direct paternal descendants of John Hancock, please let me know. But in this case, we have uh, uh, seven matches in the whole database that match these 12 markers. Notice here a mutation. These are all Hancock except this individual right here. This could be an individual that is related to the Hancock family and there's been a, a surname change, or that just matches his DNA by chance to the rest of the Hancock. But the fact that I have one, two, three, four, five, and six individuals who are Hancocks, and the most recent common ancestor of this individual predate uh, Mosiah that match this, then I can be pretty sure that what I have in my hand is a Hancock, pretty good Hancock profile. And then com comparing just the 12 markers I have uh, with the Joseph Smith, you know, I took all the other ones out because, of course, you know, I don't have them for, for this individual to compare. Then uh, find a lot of differences between the two of them. So the fact that they matched the Hancock, not the Smith. Again, Mosiah was a Hancock and not a Smith. And this is going to be published this year in the John Wilmer Historical Association Journal, I think, in this, this fall. So now we have four of these, uh, five of these individuals cross out from this list. Of course, there's a list that continues to grow, but you know, one by one, we might we may get through most of them. Now, there's going to be some cases we're probably never going to be able to solve. 
uh, particularly children that die in infancy, do not, have, uh, do not grow up to adulthood, have children of their own, and so we don't have a living posterity. I'm not really in the business of going around and dig up graves and testing um, babies' bones. You know, I think that there is a limit to <laughs> what is right to do or not. But the other thing is that since these are people that die 150 years old, there are a lot of situations in which how can you be sure that the bones that you find are actually the person that you think it is. And so you, you start creating a lot of if situation that uh, uh, I, I just don't like to deal with. Okay, so going back to the first question, the original question was, uh, can, can we tell now after almost 10 years something about Joseph Smith's paternal ancestry based on his DNA? Okay, and so some of the things, so this is the, the 43 markers that you saw in a few of the, of the slides. Question is where in England, if in England it came from, and the, the, the speculation is that since the man, his name was John Whittingham, that took this Robert Smith with him to Boston, Massachusetts. Robert was 12 years old. This John Whittingham had property back in Curtin, Lincolnshire, England. Therefore, the assumption has been made that Robert Smith was also from Curtin, Lincolnshire, England. And that if you go to the Family Search website and you look for the Joseph Smith uh, pedigree, you find Curtin, Lincolnshire, England, although there is no strong genealogical evidence with the, with the exception of the fact that the man he came with was from the area. Okay, but it wasn't related to him. And so, First, I start looking closely at England. Okay, let's see if it's really from, from Curtin. Let's see if we can say something. And uh, I run, um, and we we'll see a couple of snapshots uh, in, in a minute, but I run these markers through our database, and uh, I could not find any uh, matches with Smith in England in our database. The only people that I could find that they shared this, uh, this uh, signature, um, they are Smith, were individuals who share Joseph Smith Jr. grandfather, Ezo Smith, as the common ancestor. So because I went to all these uh, reunions, now I have a bunch of Smiths that are related to each other, and so they all come up when I do a query of this database. They are in the database. This will make sense more. I see a lot of you with big question marks on your head, but it will make sense in a min more sense in a minute. The other thing is that there is a large study, independent from, uh, from what I'm doing, at this website, where they're trying to study all the different lineages of Smith. As you know, Smith is a surname that uh, people took over based on the, um, on the trade that they were doing. So everyone that was a blacksmith, a locksmith, a goldsmith, they all became Smith. 1% of uh, um, surname in the United States and 1% in the UK are Smith. It's the most common surname. Also, in 1600, the most common first name was Robert. <laughs> looking, you know, you're looking at a very common individual. It's like a, truly a needle in a haystack. And, uh, and this, uh, in this, uh, on this website, they have data, extensive data, for 272 Smiths, genealogical data and, uh, and uh, genetic data, of people that are trying to find out how the different Smiths are related to each other. All these Smiths that came to northeastern uh, United States, so we're talking about Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, even Ohio, you know, in this area. Can we differentiate one line from the other? And I ran this, um, this uh, uh, profile there, and I found only one match with, out of all the 272, and the one match was from an individual born in Vermont in 1800, last name Smith. Okay, and John Smith was born in Vermont in 1805. I asked our genealogists if they could find a link between the two. There is nothing about this guy. We don't even know where he came from outside of the United States. There is a, a little brick wall. Maybe Craig Foster here uh, later can help me uh, looking for some. Uh, for some uh, uh, if we can extend the genealogy to this individual, I'll be happy to give the name to you. Uh, I think it was a Sheldon Samuel Smith or something like that, but we'll... Uh, um, it's not important. But anyway, very rare. Okay, very rare. It doesn't even match the Smith. Not only... Uh, I couldn't find anything in the database. I cannot even find anything in, with other Smiths from the same area. Then I look on the white pages of Curtin, Lincolnshire, find there are 1,100 households that are Smith, wrote to each one of them. True story. <laughs> <laughs> I sent 1,100 letters to Curtin, 
I also had a friend living in England and asked her to buy me 1,100 stamps from UK to United States so that she could send it to me so that I could put a, a self-address stamp envelope in it so I didn't even have to pay for the response, okay? Kind of make things easy. And uh, I got only 33 people to send me their DNA. Of course, you know, <laughs> you get this letter from this guy with a swab, you know, like, what do you do? But 33 people sent me their DNA from Curtin. These are all Smith. Zero matches. No one was similar to that. So kind of like, okay, you know, there is, you know, not very much there uh, with regard of, a, of an English connection. So let's look at the DNA now. Let's think outside the box. Where could this DNA be found if it's not in the area of England? So this is a program, this is the website right here, where you can enter actually all the numbers from the previous profile right here, and uh, it essentially looks for these commonalities I was telling you to get before, and put people into the same family or clade or group. It's, a, it's called an haplogroup predictor. Now, it predicts, so it's not accurate 100%. It gives like its best guess. There is like a percentage of confidence here. In this case, it's 100% and a score uh, of how confident somebody with these values would fit into this group and not in another group. Now, why is it important for, uh, to know the haplogroup? Because haplogroups are, in many cases, geographic specific. For example, individuals that belong to an haplogroup that is E3A are found mostly in Africa. Okay, I'd be interested to, che to check uh, the Rios gray Y chromosome, see, you know, if he, if he has an E3 or if, uh, is a European, you know, you know, many African American have also European lines. Uh, we have also, you know, I Scandinavian mostly. J is a Middle Eastern. It's been linked also to a lot of Jewish groups. And uh, I'm a K, which is also Middle Eastern. No, sorry, this is Y chromosomes. <laughs> Talking about that, something else. I'm, a, I'm actually a, a C. It's not even listed here, which is Asian. So I, I have a Y chromosome that is Asian. Don't ask me why. I'm trying to figure out that. We'll be in the next year presentation. <laughs> R1A is Eastern Europe, and R1B uh, is, uh, is from uh, Western Europe. It's very common in Western Europe. This is kind of like a tree of how all the different haplogroups are related from each other, like you saw before. This is where R1B is, uh, is uh, kind of like a, a sister clay to R1A because one is found in Eastern Europe, the other one is found mostly in Western Europe. Now, you can find in both places, but that's where the highest frequencies are. And uh, in most cases where you find the highest frequencies, you think that's where it is uh, indigenous of. That's where it came from because he had more time. He's been there longer, and he had more time to create a larger number of people that belongs to that group. This is the um, a frequency map for R1B. You see the two highest spots are right here in uh, uh, in Iberia and the Iberian Peninsula, and then also in the UK, both in Ireland, Scotland, and uh, and England and Wales over there. So that's the, the distribution. Again, this is based on the fact that we are assuming that Joseph Smith belongs to this R1B. Um, this is the query I did before, just to show you again, you know, all the people that uh, matches his uh, uh, Joseph Smith genealogy, they all tie in back with uh, Azor Smith, who's the grandfather, and you see that the genealogy we got from these people, they all say England, but again, it's based on family search data. Okay, so based again on the assumption that it could have been from England. So this is what I did. So our database has 23,000, over 23,000 of this Y chromosome signature. I r look at the 150 who are either exact matches or closest matches to Joseph Smith Y chromosome. And this is the distribution I found. 22 of these people are Smith because they are related to Joseph Smith through Azor Smith. Same family, of course they match, okay? Now, 35 were from Ireland, 12 from Scotland, 8 from England. These are other surnames. These are not Smith. These are only people based only on genetic, um, that they match, gen match genetically, not by surname. Two from Denmark, and then there were 72 others that did not have enough genealogy to go up outside the United States, but many of these names were Max or O'Donnell, you know, like a lot of Irish and, uh, and uh, Scottish surnames. Here you see uh, what I told you, you know, what, how many generations, how many years ago we can estimate a connection between the Smith line and some of these individuals in the database based on, uh, on, on mismatches. So 34 out of 36 marker 
We estimate a common ancestor 400 years ago, 33 out of 36, 600 years ago, and 32 out of 36, 800 years ago. Why is this important? It's because Robert Smith appears in America about 400 years ago. So we are trying to find a common ancestor with this line somewhere past that 400 years ago. Okay? So I'm expecting to find not perfect matches, but close matches, because there have been so many years where this mutation could kick in. Okay, we're almost done here, uh, so bear with me for, for one more, uh, for a few more minutes. So here is just a, a, an example of a query page, you know, like here we have uh, matches from 90 to 100, and Seaholt is Irish, you know, not a lot of English matches to the Smith haplotype. So is, uh, is Joseph Smith's paternal lineage truly Irish? That's the question. So maybe it's not English, maybe it's Irish. How can I confirm that? There is another test you can do on the Y chromosome, which is called a SNP test, single nucleotide polymorphism. You look at a specific changes in the DNA which are very, very stable over the years. They do not mutate very much. They're kind of like a genetic milestone, milestones. And uh, we found that the Smith DNA tested positive for this marker called M222. This marker, see this is the R1B we saw before, now you can subdivide the R1B branches, smaller little teeny branches, and some of them have very, very specifically geographically. So these are all some branches of R1B. What are we doing here? We're increasing the level of resolution. You kind of, you know, you have a, uh, your, uh, something is not focused and you're trying to make a little bit more focus and uh, calibrate a little more. And where is this marker found? Where this is the distribution of it, where you find the darker red is where this marker is found at the highest frequency. It's found in Northwest Ireland and also a little bit in low, lowland Scotland, which makes sense since most of the matches that the haplotype we had and the genealogists match with Ireland and some with Scotland. Remember the, the, the matches that we had. And now we have also the genetic confirmation that this is the case. Also came across to this paper, was published a couple of years ago. Some of you might have heard of Niall and the, of the Nine Hostages, was a warlord of the 5th century, um, legendary figure from which about five centuries of uh, Irish rulers came from. So essentially the whole royal dynasty between the 5th century and the 10th century uh, could be a descendant of this legendary figure, Niall of the Nine Hostages. Just like the, uh, the Gang Genghis Khan study, they think that the, the high frequency of this particular uh, genetic signature in this area is, that's kind of like a speculation, but could be attributed to the fact that this royal family had a lot of posterity. You know, of course, if you have a lot of money, a lot of power, you can have a lot of children, I guess, you know, one way or the other. <laughs> you know, that's what Genghis Khan did and, um, in, in, in Mongolia and in Asia. So here we have, a, a, in Ireland, this very high concentration, and compare it this reconstructed profile of this nine of the nine hostages to the Joseph Smith one, and found that it's very, very similar. Consider the amount of time we are the separate these two events. There are only three mutations, and there are only one-step mutations. Once, you know, usually when DNA mutates, in these cases with, uh, with DNA, it goes either up one number or low one number. You know, and then after a few generations, it can go low on other numbers, so then you'll have two-step mutation, okay? That means that it's farther distantly related. So here, very close. And so, uh, a lot of these surnames were those that came out in the query I did before. Uh, just very interesting, you know, like a very rare haplotype. It's found uh, uh, at 20 percent frequencies in Donegal, in this area right here. Uh, before we saw that the marker, the, the, the apogroup marker is found in this area. Now the haplotype is found in the same area. We have two genetic witnesses. Joseph Smith matched both of them, you know, seems to me, based on the data that I have, I'd like to propose an idea that perhaps uh, this uh, indentured servant, this 12 years old boy, probably was of Irish descendant, perhaps only one or two generations before they were living in Ireland. And you know that this time, you know, Irish, you know the struggles and, and the economy probably moved too long to, to, to England. Irish people were not viewed very well in England. Perhaps there was a surname change. So perhaps Smith is not Smith, was something else at some point. Um, name change, start working for this family. And the reason I say only one or two generations is that 
because we are not finding any Smiths in that area. There is no, they, haven't, they probably did not live in England as an Irish family for many generations because otherwise they would have had a large posterity and then you would find a lot of, uh, um, of genetic matches, which you don't. So probably was uh, something that happened fairly quickly. So, um, so this is kind of like you know, my, my proposed theory you know, that Joseph Smith was probably not a Smith at some point and, uh, and uh, it was of Irish uh, descent on the paternal line. Now I hope that that doesn't change anyone's testimony here. You know, I hope you feel, you feel okay about the Irish people. <laughs> I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just, there is another genetic marker that follows the maternal line. I was able to find uh, a, a sister of Joseph Smith uh, that had a living female descendant that matches this kind of paternal uh, paternal, um, uh, maternal uh, inheritance pattern. We uh, tested this individual. It's only one individual, but most of the time you're not sure about who the father is. You can be pretty sure about who the mother is. You know, she carries the child around for nine months. You know, <laughs> while the, you know, the husband is there maybe five minutes and then he's gone, buy some cigarettes or something, not coming back. <laughs> so. So we're pretty sure about this, and so we tested this uh, because uh, Joseph Smith uh, would have had this type of DNA, but would not have given to, her ch to his children. It only goes from, through the maternal line. So the mother gave it to all the children, but only the daughters gave it to the next generation. So that's why I need to find a maternal line that ties back in. So Lucy Mack would have given her mitochondrial DNA, this marker, to all of her children, but only Lucy and Catherine passed it on to the next generation. Okay, I know that this is a... Uh, uh, we don't have enough time to, sp to spend too much time on that. But anyway, we reconstructed that profile as well. Estimated, uh, we we, we, we uh, confirmed that it uh, belongs to a, a maternal lineage that belongs to an apple group called apple group H. Uh, apple group H is, uh, is found with the highest frequency in the, uh, in the Berrien Peninsula in the UK, similar to the male R1B. So uh, we also know that uh, Joseph Smith's straight paternal line, so if you have his pedigree and you look at the two outermost branches, now we know something about the Irish connection on the paternal line, we know something about the maternal connection uh, based on the, mater uh, the maternal uh, DNA, the mitochondrial DNA. So this is, a, you know, I still don't know if this picture is Joseph or not, but one of the things that, uh, that is of interest to me is that uh, we, we're interested in this individual. We want to know everything there is to be known about him, what he said, what he wrote, what he looked like, you know. And so I feel like uh, that uh, as I was doing one thing or another thing, I realized all at once that we know something about his genetic picture, his genetic profile, you know. We know what his, what his writings are, you know, there, there's going to be a lecture tomorrow on his papers. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, a lot of discussion about what he looks like, and now we know something about genetically also what it looks like, a genetic profile that has been available for the first time. We know that both the maternal and the paternal haplogroups to a high degree of resolution. We know the maternal mitochondrial DNA profile for this individual, and we also know a 43 marker Y chromosome profile for him. Why are this information important? Well, that can be used for other studies. For example, now that we know what his DNA is, there are a number of um, uh, remains or, uh, or items that, uh, like hair samples or bones, or these are pieces of clothing from, uh, from the martyrdom that might have blood stains on it, that were, were passed on from generation to generation, but you cannot be for sure that this is Joseph Smith hair. Somebody might mistakenly label them, but now that you know what his DNA looks like, what can you do? You can try and attempt to extract DNA from these artifacts and uh, see if it match what we already know for sure about his DNA. So it can be used for studies like this. And now the, the next big project we're working on is to find the, the actual paternity of Josephine uh, Fisher. I'm not gonna, fortunately there is no time to talk about that, but basically you cannot use neither Y chromosome or mitochondrial DNA for her because she didn't get her Y chromosome from her father being a female. She got her mitochondrial DNA from her mother. We don't have any problems knowing who her mother is. And so there are other markers that we need to look for. And in attempt to do that, we have already collected DNA sample from 120 individuals who descended from her. And we're looking at what is called autosomal markers, which are more complex to trace. But hopefully in the next year or so, we'll have some answer about that. And why this is important, this is probably the strongest case 
about a biological child, Joseph Smith, based on an affidavit that she left uh, uh, later in her life, in which her mother said, you are Joseph Smith's uh, daughter. And, uh, and so we like to demonstrate if that was a biological thing or maybe a spiritual thing, you know, like in the eternity you are his, you know, but we like to prove that. Thank you for your time. Uh, John Lathrop is said to be the common ancestor of Joseph Smith, Pali Pratt, and others. Have you have any, have any evidence for or against it? Um, ge this is something you can only prove genealogically, because as you can say, Lathrop is a different surname, and so although he's a common ancestor to the Pratt, to the Smith, to the others, does not share a paternal line with, uh, with John Lathrop. Therefore, you cannot use the genetic markers that we know for sure belongs to Joseph Smith to prove that connection from a genetic point of view. Uh, we kind of have to trust the, the genealogical data on that. But I'm pretty confident that it is because John Lathrop was an important figure uh, in, uh, in US history, so there is no really reason to, to, to that. I'm sure a lot of you are John Lathrop descendants, even if you don't know that. Um, what do you think of the claim by Kerry Boren, which I never heard of, okay, sorry, <laughs> that he is a descent of Joseph Smith from Isaac Morley's daughter, Lucy Dianta? Um, I don't know. Bring him over and let's test him. You know, let's look at his DNA. <laughs> what, have, what have been the reaction of the families involved in your study as the results came out? Or do they know yet? Well. Not all this, on not all the cases, I have permission to share these results. As you notice, though, I did not put any names of individuals that have been tested. Okay? Um, this is just part of common ethics. You just do not put information in genealogy and in genetic study of individuals that are born within the last 100 years. Okay? So you keep them anonymous. So in, there is not a particular individual that that we kind of spotlighted here. But with regards of now the family knowing that the particular ancestor is not Smith's descendants or somebody else, I think they were kind of relieved. Um, I had permission to share this information, but they told me many times, like, you know, I don't really care, I just want to know. You know, that's just kind of like the common, the common thing. I did have a couple instances, though, in which I did a DNA test for other um, situation and uh, the family was very upset because they thought it was, you know, visions and dreams. They say that they were linked them to Joseph Smith and they were convinced that that was it and the DNA was wrong. And, uh, you know, I am pretty confident, you know, although the, uh, what uh, Blake Ostler said that, uh, you know, all, not all the scientists are, uh, agree with each other, but uh, when there are things you can be confident about science and I'm pretty confident about the result I produced with these cases. So, if the family is not happy, I'm not going to, to talk about those things and promote them or publish them or so on. But usually when I, when I tell them, because it costs money to do this type of test, and all the money is being donated by, uh, I mean, uh, not that it, so because of the work I do, I have access to equipment and, uh, and, and type of tests that would cost a lot of money to do if you do that commercially. So essentially we do these things in house. But the reality is, you know, when I do that and I say, you know, okay, I'm going to spend the time to do this and we use some of our resources to do that, I would like to be able to use this information perhaps for a publication or, you know, I think people not like to know that. If they say no or yeah, you know, kind of based on that, then we do the study. So most of the cases, they're happy and they're willing to share that. Since there are so many at, of Hiram descendants in the church, why didn't you use these descendants rather than Joseph for your study? I use them both. I use Samuel. I use... Uh, uh, I have descendants of John Smith, who's a brother of Joseph Smith Sr., and uh, Silas Smith, who is the clan that uh, settled down in Arizona, so we use all of them. In fact, we use a lot of uh, descendants of Joseph Smith Sr. who are not Smith. We test an uh, individual who has, kind of goes right down to like a, a male, female, male line, you know, so this last name will be different, and, uh, but we're still interested in uh, being able to reconstruct a better this is a work in progress, basically. So we're testing a lot of the Smith descendants to kind of continue to extend on this knowledge. Last question. How would you respond to the accusation that it is a double standard 
to accept DNA testing that, Joseph, that helps Joseph Smith, but do not to accept DNA testing that supposedly refused the Book of Mormon. We're talking about apples and oranges here. Okay, there are completely two different things. We have a, a frame of reference. We're looking at specific markers within a family. We know exactly how these things are transmitted, and we know what the DNA of the individual that we're starting with uh, looks like based on what we did. You know, with the Book of Mormon, we don't know what Lehi's DNA look like. We don't know uh, a lot of other things. You know, I really like some of the things that's been written on Fair's really, you know. Um, on farms, there is a great book out there if you want to read it, but there are different, uh, different approaches. You cannot compare. This one, this is a, it's kind of like saying, you know, how, how do you accept one and not the other? But, you know, DNA is used for medicine, for pharmaceutical purposes, for archaeology, for anthropology, which is more like the DNA Book of Mormon issue. Uh, for ancestry and genealogy, which is more what I show today. So you can't just use the word, the word DNA loosely and think that you would have the same outcomes, and especially you can use the same param parameters for all these type of studies. The limitations and the, and, and the issues that you need to deal with are very much different, so two completely different things. Very confident about what I uh, showed to you, and uh, you know, if there is any geneticist in the audience that like to r duplicate the, te the, the results, more welcome to do so, but this is, a, this is as good as you get, and, and this is a good thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. Very good job. Very good.